So very good morning to everyone. Uh, today we are going to uh, see the research topic uh, solar driven photocatalytic water splitting. In this case, we are mainly producing hydrogen from uh, water splitting for our sustainable future. So yeah, this is the brief uh, background that uh, as we all know, the world population keep increasing and we require tremendous uh, amount of energy and we are getting it from mostly fossil fuels that we know uh, from coal oil and natural gas uh, which really uh, make uh, serious issues with the uh, environmental problem because these are the source for uh, greenhouse gases production and also on the other side these fossil fuel might uh deplete nearly 50 to 100 years and if you look at the world energy consumption it might it will be doubled uh about 2050 so we have to look uh, uh renewable and alternative energy which is supposed to be carbon neutral so where we can uh have that much huge amount of energy as we all know from sun, we are receiving every year about thousand times more energy than what we consumed actually. So that you can see by this number. Okay. How we can use this solar energy effectively or how we can store it and use it uh, in the coming years or in future. So the first thing I want to uh, tell you is the solar cell. So in solar cell, we know uh, we can convert solar energy into electricity, but there is a one issue with this that we cannot store it for long time, that uh, we can use it immediately as soon as it produces electricity, but it's difficult to store it for, let's say, few months or few years. On the other hand, if we able to convert solar energy into chemical energy, the uh, way of uh, storing the uh, solar energy in the chemical bonds, we can able to uh, use it for a uh, prolonged time. So this is, uh, we all know, uh, photosynthesis does the same uh, things, which actually fuels life on uh, Earth for us, that uh, it will take the solar light and then carbon dioxide water and it produces oxygen and carbohydrates. So the same way we are going to uh, think about how we can produce hydrogen from water using solar energy. So before uh, how to produce hydrogen from water, I want to uh, show you what are the major uh, areas we are using hydrogen uh, currently globally. So there are two ways uh, hydrogen has been used. One is uh, indirect way. So the hydrogen uh, can be used as a feedstock in the another in, in the direct way hydrogen can be directly used as a fuel so first we see in this slide how it has been used as a feedstock if you look at the chart on the right hand side you can see 55 percent of hydrogen used for only one chemical reaction which is ammonia production by haber bosch process in industry and uh 25 percent for getting diesel and gasoline from crude oil and 10% for methanol production. This methanol has been mostly used in uh, polymer industries and 10% for other applications like uh, metal alloying, glass production, electronics industry, and uh, uh, preventing corrosion in power plant pipelines and steel manufacturing. But if you look at the source for hydrogen for the nowadays, uh, we are using hydrogen. The source is from fossil fuel, which is natural gas, methane. From methane, we are uh, it's, uh, getting a hydrogen and this makes a serious issue as I said before carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide other uh, harmful gases. So as I said before, so this is the very uh, promising application. Hydrogen can be directly used as a fuel in fuel cell because uh, this doesn't emit any carbon uh, source at the end of the uh, process. So you can see here the animation that uh, from one side, 
we apply the hydrogen from other side, we apply the oxygen. So once hydrogen hits the anode, it will produce the electron uh, through the external uh, circuit and it produces electricity. So after generating electron, the hydrogen becomes H+, which pass through the proton exchange membrane into the cathode. There it will meet the oxygen and the finally we get heat and water vapor. So that's why I said this is zero carbon process. That's why globally it has been highly promising and already some uh, applications currently uh, globally we are using it. So for example, it, this fuel cell, hydrogen fuel cell has been used uh, to supply electricity to the aircraft. Um, some fuel cell power, rail vehicles, some electric buses, and passenger cars. As I said before, where the source for hydrogen, again, we have to depend on fossil fuel. Okay, how we can get hydrogen from water splitting? So this is the textbook equation that how one can uh, produce uh, hydrogen uh, by uh, solar energy with the photocatalyst. As you see here, when we shine a light on photocatalyst material, it will generate electron and holes, uh, which we say generally charge carriers. And these holes uh, combine uh, with the water molecule and then it produces oxygen. For that, we have to have 1.23 volt at least energy. And the proton produced from this reaction combined with the electron and produce two molecules of hydrogen. So overall energy we require for this reaction to happen is 1.23 volt, but this is not enough. Or maybe we need a little bit more energy because during our experimental circumstances, we probably need some over potential. So here I'm going to show you what are the different methods have been developed so far for producing hydrogen from water. In addition to solar, just purely electrolysis based hydrogen production also possible. If you look at on the left hand side, we can uh, really uh, categorize into three uh, photovoltaic based electrolysis. In, in this case, we strongly apply the external bias externally. And in the second category, we say it's a photoelectrochemical. And it has two subcategory that uh, in one case, we shine a light as well as we apply a little bit uh, external bias to produce hydrogen. In tandem cell type of cases, we don't apply any external bias. It's purely uh, driven by the solar energy. And third category, this is the most important and a lot of people are really uh, hoping that if this is going to be the, or this has more potential uh, to, to, to be an alternative uh, possible method in future in which uh, we take semiconducting uh, material powders in water and then we disperse it and then we take a suitable redox mediator inside. And in the second category, subcategory of this, we can also uh, deposit this uh, powder suspense, suspension on the substrate so that uh, we can have a photocatalyst film. And people claim that this, with this we can make a large area uh, uh, photocatalysis system. In this, we are comparing uh, the efficiency or the complexity, how, what are the practical, uh, the, the, the commercial feasibility among these three system. If you look at the x-axis, the system complexity, this photocatalysis, as I mentioned before, taking the photocatalyst powder in water or the putting the paste of that photocatalyst uh, in a substrate is the easiest one, easy to uh, perform, easy to measure, and most of, uh, mostly it doesn't cost so much. So it is less expensive, plus less complex. With this, if we were able to reach in future about uh, five, per, five to 10% of STH, STH is solar to uh, hydrogen conversion efficiency. So this we will see where we are uh, currently, uh, what, what is the uh, maximum efficiency we achieved so far and how long it will probably take to achieve five to 10% of STH um, for, for, for practical application. So as I said before, 
the particulate suspension system has been focused highly. That's why I'm going to show next a few slides about this uh, suspension uh, system. Uh, in this case, there are two types. People can do the water splitting with just single semiconducting material. In this case, as you see in the figure, we just take one semiconducting material, mostly metal oxide semiconductors. Uh, in this, once we shine a light, it will produce electron and holes and holes perform the water oxidation producing oxygen and the electron perform the water reduction producing hydrogen. And I want to mention there are certain number of limitations that this kind of carrying out the whole water splitting using single uh, semiconductor, we have to have wider band gap semiconductors and they are not in great numbers, only few semiconductors so far found uh, to uh, produce uh, uh, hydrogen by this type of single photocatalyst system. And uh, you know, when band gap is larger, it does not uh, absorb the, the, the visible side of the solar spectrum. So it can absorb only the UV uh, region of the solar spectrum, which is only 5% from the solar spectrum. That's why it fails to utilize the maximum solar energy. And also when we don't have a, uh, separation of efficient separation of the product, which is hydrogen oxygen in our case. So it will immediately form the water, which is the back reaction. So in the, on the other side, there's, uh, I think for the, for the last five to 10 years, the people are mostly putting efforts in this Z scheme, because this Z scheme is inspired from the natural photosynthesis. If we look at the natural photosynthesis system, it looks like two photocatalysts. One does the oxidation, the another one does the reduction reaction. So based on the mediator we use in the Z scheme, we can still subcategorize into three types, liquid redox mediator, solid and without redox mediator. So we are going to quickly have a look on these three types. So Z scheme with liquid redox mediator, as I said, you can see the redox mediator, we take as a salt, let's uh, for example, I minus IO3 minus Fe2 plus Fe3 plus this uh, redox couples, we can use it in this type of scheme. And this is the easiest way one can study the system, how it uh, produces hydrogen from water. So one acts as a OEP and the another one is a HEP. So OEP have to have deep enough valence band potential so that their holes can easily uh, do the water oxidation. Similarly, the HEP photocatalyst, which is hydrogen evolution photocatalyst, have to have a valence band more negative so that it can easily efficiently produce hydrogen from water. And so I said, uh, this is two different uh, semiconductors, so uh, we don't need to have uh, like a larger band gap uh, semiconductors so that we can use more visible solar energy and we can have so many number of choices in semiconducting material. That is the advantage of this Z scheme uh, water splitting compared to single photocatalyst water splitting. So the second type is a Z scheme with a solid redox mediator. In this case, we just replace the mediator by uh, solid, which is most of the cases people use a reduced graphene oxide, uh, gold, silver and conductive carbon. This is, people believe that this is more favorable because in liquid case, there will be the diffusion kind of issues which probably uh, do some side reaction. But in this case, solid as a redox mediator, we don't have such a uh, diffusion process. That's why people say this is more facile and uh, appropriate to practical use. However, this is not as easy as with the liquid mediator to construct this type of a configuration, but it is possible. So in that case, we, uh, there is no redox mediator and people say this is heterojunction. The schematic looks like simple, but uh, constructing this type of uh, configuration is really very challenging because we have to have a uh, uh, electron exchange between these two materials if we really want to form a heterojunction between these two or we have to make strong absorption of one photocatalyst on another.
Okay, so previously we see in the previous slides that what are the different methods have been developed and what is highly focused and what are those single photocatalysts and lizard skin. Now, in this slide, you can see what are the different semiconducting materials so far uh, efficiently used in photocatalysts. And in this scheme, uh, mostly uh, inorganic metal oxide semiconducting material, except the carbon nitrate that you can see on the right hand side. So some highly suitable for water oxidation reaction, some suitable for water reduction. If you look at their valence band, conduction band position, you can clearly understand uh, why we say this is suitable for water reduction and why for water oxidation. But these uh, inorganic uh, semiconducting materials is a little bit uh, uh, difficult to tune their properties. If we want to really, for example, if we want to modify some surface changes to make it selective adsorption of uh, um, relax ions or the water molecules on it, it's really, it's, it's really very challenging. And also it's self photocorrosive sometimes and it's not more earth abundant. So its availability is a little bit expensive. That's why uh, recently uh, a lot of researchers looks into polymeric semiconductors because the main reason is this is earth abundant, so it will be uh, low. It it will be very cheap. Uh, and also the polymeric semiconductor properties can be easily tunable by simply changing the uh, preparation protocols. And this already has been proved in solar cell and some photoelectrochemical devices and LED that these polymeric semiconductors can be a suitable alternative for metal oxide semiconductors. And there is another uh, uh, excellent parameter we have to mention. This is prolonged uh, stability. It can stable for long. And this is the really required parameter that I will show you in the uh, next slide. Okay, so we have seen so many metal oxide semiconductors or polymeric semiconductor, but how we evaluate which is best. So based on these three parameters, one can easily evaluate the photocatalyst uh, that the rate of gas evolution, apparent quantum yield and solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency. And out of these three, uh, people would like to see the apparent quantum yield and solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency because this can be directly uh, say that how long it will take to get the reachable uh, five to 10% uh, uh, solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency. Okay, in this graph, I really want to show you where we stand at this point. I mean, for the last uh, four decades, we keep even more than four decades. Uh, we are working on this since from 1972 that, uh, a uh, lot of water splitting reaction and most of the reaction they probably report only water oxidation or hydrogen generation not both the overall water splitting and currently uh, uh, we have uh, the maximum efficiency is about one percent and lifetime of the photocatalyst has been few days to few weeks and maximum months but not more than that and hence it is not economical because if you really want to compete with the current hydrogen production method, which is uh, uh, extracting the hydrogen from natural gas, we have to have higher efficiency and long lifetime. As you can see, the US Department of Energy and the Japan Ministry of Economy, they have uh, predicted that if we will able to reach in future the STH of five to 10% with the lifetime of the photocatalyst five to 10 years, we can easily avail the hydrogen uh, a kilogram of hydrogen for two to four US dollar. So at that point, we can really able to uh, use uh, hydrogen in our everyday routine life. But for that, we have to do a lot of uh, uh, optimization and other strategies. That is what we are going to discuss in the next few slides. So what are the strategies we can really adopt to enhance the STH from 1% to 5% or 10%? Above, above 5%. So these are few, maybe there are more, more uh, other than uh, what I explained here, the co-catalyst loading and surface engineering, 
morphology control of the catalyst and the crystallinity of the material and reducing the defect density in the semiconductors and coupling with the plasmonic nanomaterials. But I'm not going to discuss all these parameters. If I discuss all this, probably it will take a long time. So I'm going to show you one or two or maximum three, I think. So in this, um, yeah, so we are going to see first the how the co-catalyst can really help to improve the efficiency of uh, water splitting. As we all know that this co-catalyst is very important. Without co-catalyst, probably we see very less hydrogen production or very less oxygen product production because we have to have very good adsorption sites. And most of the co-catalyst, for example, platinum and ruthenium has been used for um, hydrogen co-catalyst and platinum oxide, ruthenium oxide has been commonly used for oxygen uh, co-catalyst. And it mainly also lower the activation energy required for water splitting. And this will really uh, suppress the recombination of uh, charge carriers. As I said before, it's a selective adsorption as well. And the other things is that it can also improve the durability by protecting the semiconductor surface uh, from the oxidized uh, by the holes. So it is very important that we have to choose the right uh, co-catalyst in addition to the photocatalyst to improve the efficiency. So this is another parameter as I mentioned in the strategies, uh, surface engineering, that when we have just uh, a photocatalyst, probably it's uh, not very specific or less hydrogen molecules produce oxygen or generating um, hydrogen. In this case, they, uh, the, the, in this paper, they showed that how uh, one can make a uh, very selective to improve the oxygen evolution from water by uh, changing their uh, tungsten oxide surface with the CCM plus. As you can see, uh, after their uh, surface modification with the CCM, it, they, they form uh, proton exchange uh, cations. So these cations specifically produce more oxygen. This is what they have proved so far. So same kind of things, but for different, for example, one can do surface engineering to improve the hydrogen evolution as well. So after that, the particle size and the morphology also matters. If you really want to improve the uh, absorbing more solar energy and improve the water splitting. So small particles allows um, uh, photo generated uh, charge case, which is the electron and holes, uh, to diffuse to the surface reaction. If you look at the scheme, my, in, in my previous slide, the, uh, the schematic, the first step is when we shine a light, it will generate the charge carriers. In step two, this generated charge carrier has to reach the surface of the photocatalyst. That is the very important step. If it fails to reach the surface, it will immediately recombine. and we don't have any uh, good results uh, for water splitting. So if you use a smaller particles, you can see from, uh, if we generate, let's say 50 nanometer or less than 50 nanometer depth, then it will easily reach the surface of the photocatalyst and there it can really go for the water oxidation or water reduction, whatever. Uh, so far, different uh, dimension have been used like nano darts, nano wires, nano sheets, porous particles. We have to be also very careful that if you use excessive small particles, so it has to be optimized. If you use excessive small particles, uh, it, instead of absorbing more uh, instant light or improving the charge carrier diffusion to the surface, it might absorb less uh, instant light. Why I am saying this is probably it will block as a, as a screening the light to reach the efficiently to the semiconductor material. So we have to be uh, very careful and we have to optimize the system. And morphology. So in this example, uh, they have used a uh, quasi honeycomb morphology of this Z scheme uh, photocatalyst like cadmium sulfide and with the solid Redax mediator gold and TaO2. So TaO2 is an oxygen evolution photocatalyst, cadmium sulfide, hydrogen evolution photocatalyst. And the idea is, 
to absorb more solar light. If you look at uh, figure E, and that they show the reflectance and the lowest reflectance is this honeycomb uh, morphology of uh, their photocatalyst structure. And they claim that, okay, if you have uh, this kind of morphology, maybe we have higher solar absorption, so higher charge carriers, the higher the efficiency of our splitting. So, yeah, although there are uh, so many advancement we have made uh, so far, there are still a lot of issues. That's why we were not able to reach that point uh, to make it practical. And we are going to see what are these key issues. The main issue is the stability. As we see in the roadmap, uh, so far our stability is around a few days to few weeks, maximum few months. And we have a uh, limited choice for oxygen evolution photocatalyst. Currently, people working in this field probably use uh, tungsten oxide and bismuth oxide. These are the very common two photocatalysts used for oxygen evolution. So we have seen a few redox couples uh, previously, and they are not stable enough in all pH uh, conditions like acidic, uh, uh, and alkaline conditions. Some redox couples are stable in acidic conditions, some are in uh, alkaline conditions. So we have to uh, find some new redox couples which are stable regardless of the uh, condition we use in a reactor. And this is the Z scheme system, as I said, it, it, it is recently developed like five to 10 years ago. Uh, since from the, for the last 10 years, the people are more uh, focused on the Z scheme system. That's why it has been less studied how the charge transfer dynamics, dynamics is happening. So we have to have a uh, study this charge carrier dynamics by DFT theory, some simulation. Um, yeah, and this rational design and configuration, as I said, for heterojunction and um, Z scheme with the solid detax mediator, we have to have so, uh, we have to have formed such a configuration which is challenging. So still this uh, construct, construction of such a system is still, uh, we, we, we have to uh, study in that. Okay, what are the future for the next five years or 10 years or even more than 10 years, people will work on what uh, kind of optimization or what kind of topic people will work. So the first thing is we have to promote more hydrogen production faster than the oxygenation to avoid. As here you have to be clear that this fact determines the stability of the photocatalyst. If we, uh, I think currently most of the photocatalyst fails to make it hydrogen production faster than oxygenation of this photocatalyst. That's why I said oxidative photocorrosion. So if we develop a photocatalyst which produces hydrogen faster than the oxygenation. We can really improve the stability for uh, long. And also, it is important to reduce the over potential required for the water splitting by selectively uh, studying few new materials or some optimization from the currently existing material. Yeah, we have to also look into more versatile, efficient redox couples other than uh, I minus, Fe2 plus, Fe3 plus, because they are very specific to certain pH condition. Spatial separation of hydrogen and oxygen also very important. Otherwise, it would form the back reaction of water, so we will lose the final conversion efficiency. So we have to work in both the ways in photocatalyst as well as suitable reactor design maybe some flow reactor in which uh, when we have a hydrogen photocatalyst on the one side and oxygen photocatalyst on the other side uh, when we pass the water it produces hydrogen and then it will remove from the top and it doesn't go immediately into the oxygen uh, cell so that it can be easily uh, separated Yeah, this is another way of uh, achieving it by photoelectrochemical tandem cells without any external bias. 
And this is really uh, very uh, important that we have to study the photocatalyst system combined with the theory to match or to study or to screen the uh, photocatalyst materials, uh, how the charge carrier generation happens, uh, how the internal quantum yield, how many uh, electrons would reach the surface of the photocatalyst. These kind of uh, uh, parameters we can really study by theory and it will easily helps to uh, elucidate the, the, the challenges in front of us. And one can also use the plasmonic nanomaterials uh, uh, for, as you, uh, so the plasmonic nanomaterials are very efficient to harvest the solar energy. So it can act as an antenna. And if you have a semiconducting material, we can use it as a reactor. So if you combine plasmonic nanomaterial with actual photocatalyst semiconducting material, and that's the concept we say antenna reactor concept, and this way, we can also improve the uh, solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency. And as I said before, the, the, there are a few things and especially the host cost reduction. So we have to find more earth abundant semiconducting materials, then only we can really uh, compete with the current existing hydrogen production method, which is production of hydrogen from methane. Yeah, that's all about it today and uh, I'm looking for your questions and I'm happy to answer and you can also ask me if you don't understand any one of my presentation you can just point me out okay this I don't understand so that I'm happy to explain you again or I can answer your questions. Thank you. Why cannot solar energy be stored for long time? What limits the energy to be used in the future? So I think uh, if we have to uh, store that electricity, even if you look at other power plants or uh, atomic uh, electricity generation, uh, we cannot store it for a long time. I don't know exactly where, uh, what limits the energy to be stored. But definitely, uh, I know people currently, we don't have any long term storage uh, um, materials or storage device so far. So the second question, what structure is most efficient for the photocatalyst? And are there any big waste or polluting products to this process? Yeah, so it's a very good question. So most efficient photocatalyst we can screen based on three factors. It has to absorb more solar energy. It has to uh, uh, diffuse those generator charge carriers into the surface of the reaction. So it has to be definitely smaller nanostructures first and the shape you mean that that's what i think you mean what structure so it has to be uh, probably something like sharp edges because there we can have more uh, active sites and some porous materials because these porous materials can also provide more active sites for uh, uh, impinging the adsorption sites so this kind of uh, photocatalyst can really improve the uh, efficiency and what are the waste? Yeah, in the case, especially this is uh, important in the case if people use polymeric semiconductors. So this is polymeric, uh, we can also say it's a plastic, say, let's say. So this has to be uh, not too much waste we can see because this is, uh, we are using only very few, like uh, let's say milligram of this. Anyway, I think we have to look into also the parallel study how the, the final product of the uh, water splitting reaction can be processed. And thank you for this question. So the next question, why do semiconductors have such 
short lifespan, what happens to them. As I mentioned before, they are self photocarazive that the oxygenation uh, of the photocatalyst is faster than the hydrogen production or the reduction reaction. So this is the most, uh, most of the semiconductors are in, uh, in this process, uh, in, 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 fell in this uh, category. And I think the reason is um, about the diffusion and the, I, th I think the kinetics has to be studied very well. And that's why at the end of the slide, I, sh uh, I, I, I showed the feature outlook that some theoretical study has to be combined with experiment to study all these parameters, how one can really improve the, uh, the, the, the lifetime of the charge carriers and what parameters really influencing or affecting uh, the, the short lifetime of the semiconductors. So next question, do you think, for example, when I use sodium hydroxide that will release oxygen from NaOH or other gases? I think if you use uh, NaOH, it's a very strong uh, alkaline, isn't it? So in this case, I think uh, you, you, have, you have to choose carefully the both, uh, if you are using Z scheme, uh, you have to be very careful the stability of the photocatalyst system. I don't think it will produce any other gases so far and I have not used any of it so far. We probably altered the pH to uh, pH 8.5 or pH 10.5 by adding few drops of any of it, but not the, 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 the solution medium is any of it I haven't used. And uh, I have no idea what other gases other than it produces. I think mainly it produces oxygen. Next question, do organic photocatalysts have similar lifespan as inorganic photocatalyst? Yes, and also more, I would say. So organic photocatalysts can have more lifespan compared to inorganic photocatalyst. And the reason is that if you look at their composition, for example, the carbon nitride, which is based on mainly carbon and nitrogen, and they are not uh, self or less self corrosive uh, compared to the metal um, inorganic uh, metal oxide uh, uh, semiconducting materials. What exactly do you mean by holes being produced in the photocatalyst when light hits in it? Maybe I can explain you with the, one of the scheme, uh, what I mean by the holes. Yeah, in this, yeah, let's say, yeah, the single photo is example. So when we, when sunlight, when solar energy has a uh, higher energy than the band gap of the semiconductor, it can really excite the electron inside. So semiconductors, uh, always you can represent it, it has a valence band and a conduction band. If the solar energy has energy higher than the band gap, it will excite the electron from the valence band so that the electron goes uh, to the uh, conduction band and the position where the electron present leaves the hole, right? So that's what the holes I mean. I hope you understand. Which is the best electrolyte? So you cannot really say this is the best electrolyte without know the information of what kind of photocatalyst you have. For example, if you have some photocatalyst which are stable in alkaline condition, not stable in acidic condition, you have to choose the alkaline condition. And this is also not just depending on the stability of the photocatalyst and also depending on the stability of the redox molecules. So the redox uh, couples. So with all these uh, concern, we can choose uh, uh, best electrolyte. Mostly we take water as the basic medium, uh, I mean, as, as, as a base of 
the, 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 the feedstock and then we add sulfuric acid drops or sodium hydroxide drops to change the uh, pH value to make it best with respect to the uh, photocatalyst and also the redox couple in the system. Is it difficult to produce organic photocatalyst? What kind of structures do the organic photocatalyst have? It is not very difficult to produce organic uh, photocatalyst. If you look at or if you simply Google it, uh, carbon nitride uh, photocatalyst, and it's uh, very easy to prepare from its precursor. Uh, a lot of people use urea, which is the easiest way to prepare carbon nitride uh, from urea and some other organic uh, precursors, and they mix it in a kind of cell. There you apply certain condition to process it, and then we will get organic semiconductor. It's not very difficult to produce organic semiconductor, definitely. What kind of structures do the organic photocatalysts have? So it can be, uh, even you can alter the uh, structure of the photocatalyst based on the, your experimental condition, as I mentioned in um, uh, how the, the strategies, how we can improve the um, water splitting efficiency. We have to uh, really um, work it on some parameters which controls the size or that the, the, the structures that produce, for example, um, nano plates or nano sheets, uh, nano dots, nano rods. This can be really controlled by the by choosing the right precursors and the right uh, or suitable experimental condition. And we can really uh, have those different structures and we have to choose which structures based on what kind of advantages we will get out of those structures. This is how we have to choose. How do you think? Where is that? Okay, before that, yes. What are your thoughts on five to 10% STH being achieved and used? in terms of how this will affect the pressure on water as a source. I think water as a source, we have a huge, plenty, plenty of water. Uh, in, in Earth, we have three fourths of um, uh, consumed by the water. So I think uh, it's not a big deal of uh, having any pressure on water as a source because we are not going to use 100% pure water. We can also, I think some studies also has been done with uh, uh, salt water, like the ocean water. So we can really uh, don't need to worry about where the source or the pressure on water as a source. And my think about this five to 10% solar to hydrogen efficiency, it is possible because if you look at 20, 30 years back, even, uh, STH of 1% was not able to achieve. Uh, like uh, I remember during uh, 1995 or 2000 around, the efficiency was, I mean, STH was about 0 0.02 or 10 to 100 times less than what we are currently. At this stage, we are at 1%. So I hope if we are carefully optimizing and uh, adopting some new strategies, definitely it is possible. It will be possible in future about in next 20 years or in 10 years maybe, or in 30 years, we don't know, but there is a great chance of achieving it. That's what I think uh, achieving this. How do you think photocatalysis can be implanted into everyday life? Mm, yes. Uh, I think in the everyday life means, see, all the products that we use, for example, if we have a car, we need a fuel. So this fuel can be uh, 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 done by the hydrogen as a fuel cell gas, right? And then uh, producing all these uh, fertilizers, ammonia fertilizers, for that we can uh, use hydrogen as a source to synthesize ammonia. And as I mentioned, 
in the beginning uh, there are some other application as well like steel some other polymer some other plastics uh, some other material synthesis so hydrogen is essential uh, to to uh, have all those materials and also there is currently uh, i think in 2017 european energy commission report they mentioned that it can also be used in household as as the a result of the hydrogen fuel cell you can see it produce heat and water so this heat can be used in winter times to warm up the uh, house hope i have answered all your questions Okay, if there is uh, no further more questions, goodbye to everyone and uh, have a good day. See you, bye-bye.